Adventures in Rocket Science. The purpose of this presentation is to share some of my experiences uh, in my career and to give those who are interested an idea of what you can do with a degree in aeronautical and astronautical engineering. After receiving my PhD from the University of Michigan in 1979, I went to work for the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and ended up working on the Galileo project, which was a spacecraft launched by the shuttle to Jupiter. <coughs> and we are interested in studying the moons uh, of Jupiter as well as Jupiter's uh, atmosphere and magnetosphere. So let's look at a illustration of uh, Jupiter and its Galilean moons. So here we have a image of uh, Jupiter uh, with the four moons which are by the way in uh, nearly coplanar circular orbits. And here's a uh, sort of montage of these uh, <coughs> moons. Uh, the uh, largest one, Ganymede, is in fact larger than the planet Mercury. So these are quite substantial bodies. Uh, the innermost moon is Io, which uh, is marked by volcanic activity due to it being so close to Jupiter uh, that tidal forces uh, are believed to have uh, melted the, the core of that satellite, resulting in active volcanoes. The next satellite out is Europa, which is covered uh, with uh, an ice surface. Callisto, which is marked by both rock and ice, and a very ancient surface of Callisto. So we have uh, in Io a new surface. And in, in uh, Callisto, an ancient surface. Because it's more distant from Jupiter and is not affected by the tidal friction. The first job that I had at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory was to work on maneuver analysis of the Galileo spacecraft, which was a dual spin spacecraft. Part of it spinning in order to do the magnetospheric measurements, that's a science requirement, uh, and part of it not spinning in order to be able to take images. This made for a very complicated spacecraft because the thrusters were on the spinning part. And I had to figure out how do you do a delta V when your thrusters are all spinning around. So that was very interesting. Uh, I later on uh, worked on uh, trajectory design and mission design. Uh, and <clears throat> when I uh, started on that aspect, uh, that was 1982, I spent uh, several years trying to design uh, a mission at Jupiter and, and being fairly successful at that to the point where a mission that I helped design was going to be flown in uh, 1986. However, what happened in 1986 in January was that the first shuttle um, crashed, that is the Challenger, January 28th, and uh, we were going to use the, 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 gal the, uh, the shuttle to get uh, to Jupiter. Once the shuttle uh, had been grounded, and also the wide-bodied Centaur, the upper stage that we needed to send the, the spacecraft to Jupiter, was canceled for safety reasons, we ended up not being able, able to launch in 1986. Uh, but if you give mission designers problems, they will uh, find interesting solutions sometimes. Uh, it turned out that with the shuttle alone uh, and the uh, IUS uh, upper stage, which is the only uh, uh, booster available to us. We were only able to go to Venus. We had no, not enough Delta V to get to Jupiter, so we ended up launching from the Earth in October of 1989, and uh, we went to Venus. And uh, is it possible to zoom in on this part? Um, uh, there we go. Beautiful. Um, we launched from the Earth. We went down to Venus. We got a gravity assist, and that took us to a larger orbit around the sun, flew by the Earth, got another gravity assist, and the bigger the orbit, the more energy you have. And then on the way through the asteroid belt, took pictures of Gaspra, came down, flew by 
the Earth one last time to get even more energy, flew by Ida, found out that it had a moon, here's an asteroid with a moon, and arrived at uh, Jupiter on December 7th, 1995. And there are other uh, scientific adventures that were done by the spacecraft during this time. So, you know, if you give mission designers a hard problem, a lot of times uh, they can come up with some innovative and interesting solutions. The uh, final trajectory that was uh, chosen for the Galileo uh, mission uh, was not one I had designed. The one I had designed was basically uh, uh, thrown away after 1986, after the tragedy. Uh, and uh, you can't repeat these things. They are unique designs. But this is an idea of uh, what happened in the real uh, case. Uh, by the time uh, the Galileo was launched, I had decided on pursuing a career as a professor at Purdue, knowing that the trajectory would take almost seven years to get to Jupiter. In that time, if I found out whether I could get tenure, uh, I'd stay at a university. If I didn't, I'd just ask for my old job back at NASA. So here's the approach trajectory to Jupiter. You see these little orbits, uh, Europa, Ganymede, Callisto, and Io. These are the orbits of the satellites around Jupiter. We go in, we fly, we do a Jupiter orbit insertion maneuver. Um, let me put that over here. JOI, Jupiter Orbit Insertion Maneuver, we have to do a delta V and use the rocket equation and get into orbit, otherwise we fly hyperbolically by and never stop at Jupiter. That maneuver puts us into this orbit, it's a big 200 day orbit, which then comes back down and flies by Ganymede, the first flyby, Ganymede 1G1, pumps the energy down into smaller orbits. Every flyby of Ganymede or Callisto or Europa will change the orbit to new orientations and to smaller sizes to do the science uh, in investigating the magnetosphere of Jupiter, which is very important, the atmosphere of Jupiter, and of course the satellites themselves. Each flyby of the satellite gave opportunities for high resolution images. So this is the itinerary that we started with and of course that mission was given extensions and went on for quite a while. And by the way, we also used patched conics for the early analysis. So patched conics are used in the real mission design work. <coughs> Next time we uh, go to Jupiter, uh, we're going to go with uh, probably a Europa orbiter mission because, as I mentioned, uh, because of the uh, <coughs> tidal effects of Jupiter on the uh, closer satellites, Europa being the next one after Io, uh, has a tidal heating that scientists determined and got evidence from the Galileo mission might in fact result in a liquid ocean below the icy crust uh, surface of Europa. Uh, 100 kilometers of water is known to be on uh, Europa, and it's believed that the top uh, four kilometers are frozen and that the remaining 96 kilometers could be a uh, liquid ocean. This is very exciting from the point of view of uh, looking for life uh, on another body in the solar system. And so there's great interest in going back to Jupiter and putting a spacecraft into orbit around Europa. And that would involve, of course, first a uh, planetary, uh, interplanetary mission, again, formulated with some uh, patched conic uh, analysis. And there's a broken plane maneuver. That's an inclination change that was needed. And then we finally arrive at Jupiter. Once we get to Jupiter, we then look at um, <clears throat> these uh, orbits around Jupiter. Here's the arrival trajectory. And this little dot represents Jupiter, and these little circles represent the four Galilean satellites. Uh, and again, with the first orbit, we do a Jupiter orbit insertion maneuver, use the rocket equation, go out to this big orbit, uh, another small maneuver here to target towards Ganymede, and then pumping the orbit down. And now we're not so interested in scientific investigation of the other uh, satellites of Jupiter, although surely we would do some. Um, we're interested in getting to Europa uh, as quickly as possible by pumping the energy out and making the orbit uh, <coughs> uh, as close to that of Europa around Jupiter. And so you finally have this end game process, a very complicated 
uh, process that involves resonances between Europa and the spacecraft. <clears throat> and this also involves um, the uh, gravity of Jupiter plus the Sun, and then we have the spacecraft. So this is in fact a three-body problem. It's a celestial mechanics problem. And uh, that means you can no longer use patched conics, but have to use the more sophisticated techniques uh, called n-body problem in <coughs> um, solving this problem. Ultimately, you get into orbit around Europa and start your uh, investigation. One of the nice things about being a professor is that I can ask my students, both my seniors in the design class that I teach and my graduate students, uh, to do research on these kinds of problems. And so here's a question I asked for my senior students, the senior design course. <clears throat> I don't want just an orbiter. Tell me what it would take to land a spacecraft on the surface of Europa. And I don't want just a lander. I then want you to drill or melt a hole through the ice crust of Europa and put a submarine into the ocean and use uh, uh, <clears throat> high definition TV, transmit pictures, look for signs of life, do a scientific investigation for 30 days and transmit all that information back to the Earth. And uh, how can we do that? And this results in some very interesting uh, work by our students, and uh, they found it, of course, uh, it wouldn't be cheap. It came up with about a seven billion dollar price tag because we would need three of these vehicles in order to have a 90 percent probability of success because it's very, very difficult. So, <clears throat> I was inspired by this uh, artwork uh, which imagined what it would be like, you know, if you could uh, probe uh, the ocean of <coughs> Europa. What you see back here is a, a, a probe um, sticking through the ice and then over here we see the submarine and it has a big bright light and it's trying to image you know whatever life forms may be there. Of course we we have not discovered life and nor do we have any direct evidence that there's life on Europa but it is probably the most likely place to look. Very exciting. Of course, the other place has been Mars. <clears throat> Mars has been uh, a, a place of great fascination for a long, long time, and the idea that there could be life, even people on Mars, is something that was practically accepted uh, until 1976, when the Viking landed on Mars and I think made the worst possible discovery you could make, which was there was no life on Mars. It searched for microbes, it searched for any signs of life, and uh, unfortunately there was nothing to be found. That doesn't mean that there, there won't be in the future. There may be evidence of life having existed, and this is still a very, very interesting aspect, but it would have been even more interesting if uh, life had been discovered by Viking, uh, we would surely have had a much more ambitious program to Mars. Now here we have uh, Bugs Bunny and uh, Marvin the Martian discussing space exploration and whether or not the Earth should be destroyed so that uh, Marvin could observe uh, the heavens unobstructed by that planet. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, to be more serious here, uh, we're interested in the case for Mars of what about people uh, living on Mars and uh, colonization. Uh, <clears throat> this question has been asked a number of times and uh, uh, President Bush the first asked NASA to do a study on what it would take to uh, send people to Mars and NASA came up with a 500 billion dollar price tag and a 30 year schedule. Unfortunately this showed a great lack of imagination and uh, this immediately uh, canceled the program because it's too much money and it's taking too long. And so how can you get the taxpayers to agree to something like that? But fortunately, 
Robert Zubrin came along and wrote a book called The Case for Mars. And he showed that if we bring hydrogen to Mars, we can combine it with the CO2, carbon dioxide, of the atmosphere. And this implies that we can get, um, for one ton of hydrogen, we can get 18 tons of methane and oxygen, which is rocket propellant. Now, what does that mean? Well, according to Zubrin, you send a rocket to Mars that's empty, and you do an in situ propellant production. So you send this nearly empty spacecraft uh, or rocket to Mars and you make propellant there. You bring hydrogen with you and for every ton of hydrogen you can make 18 tons of propellant. And that changes the problem from a 500 billion dollar price tag down to 25 billion dollars. That's a 95 percent discount <clears throat> and all of a sudden we're in business now. This is very exciting. By the way, uh, Robert Zubrin has visited Purdue several times, including as a uh, guest uh, in the uh, Space Forum a number of years ago. Again, another nice thing about being a professor is being able to have students work on these ideas. And I started teaching the uh, uh, senior design course in 2001 and asked my first class to look at what would it take for the first human mission to Mars using Zubrin's plan. OK, use Zubrin idea of in-situ propellant. And uh, also, let's add a couple things. Let's uh, use the um, Mars-Venus free return. Mars-Venus-Earth uh, free return. This was discovered uh, by my PhD student, Dr. Maza Okutsu, working with me on looking for ways of getting astronauts back from uh, their trip to Mars if they couldn't land uh, they could have a gravity assist with Venus uh, that would bring, bring them back to the Earth in the 800 days of uh, what their normal mission would have been. And so that's, that would limit um, the consumables you would need to take. I also asked these students to look at using nuclear thermal rockets because they are more efficient. Uh, they had to land a, um, a HAB on Mars. And also I want artificial gravity. And so you see this uh, long tethered uh, object in the picture. And um, let me just go on to another uh, similar mission because it has a, a good picture of a tether. So here we have a, a tether connecting uh, the uh, <coughs> part of the vehicle where the astronauts live and then maybe their power plant, nuclear uh, reactor, and other uh, stuff. And so if you have this tether, you can uh, spin the rocket around, spin the vehicle around, and what that does is it creates artificial gravity, uh, basically acceleration towards the center. And uh, that would get rid of a lot of the serious problems that we have in micro G, because that's uh, pretty devastating to your health uh, after a while. And we wouldn't have to worry about it. Um, another version of going to Mars would be, before we land, why not do an orbital mission? When we went to the moon with Apollo, we first went into orbit with Apollo 8 before we tried landing. And we did other missions that uh, kind of tested out. Um, <clears throat> for example, Apollo 10 didn't land, but it uh, got within um, 50,000 feet of the, uh, the surface of the moon. And so if we break the problem down into simpler steps, uh, we're more likely to be successful and safe. And so in a, a first orbital mission at Mars where you don't land, you may go there uh, and use this uh, tether to create artificial gravity. And then uh, we might even use aero capture. So here we have artificial gravity. <clears throat> uh, 
And uh, aero capture means uh, flying through the atmosphere of Mars and not having to do a delta V with rocket propellant, but using a heat shield to do the delta V for us. Kind of getting a, it's almost a free ride, but you do have to pay for the heat shield. And here's what we've done. We've just uh, sort of uh, reeled in the tether and put the spacecraft together uh, as one uh, unit, uh, achieve capture, and then extend the tether again and get back our artificial gravity by causing this to spin. And uh, we could spend uh, 500 days in orbit at Mars, send the astronauts back to the Earth, and then say, okay, maybe next time we could land. And in fact, what I would also advise doing is, while we're in orbit, let's send an unmanned uh, lander, test it out, and see if it works. And if that safely lands and returns, then we can put people on it next time. One of the things that inspired me to work on the uh, case for Mars was uh, my opportunity to work with Dr. Buzz Aldrin, who um, was the second man to walk on the moon. He's, uh, uh, he was on the first human landing mission at the moon. And he also received his PhD uh, in aerospace engineering at uh, MIT. <coughs> so uh, he's a true rocket scientist. He came to uh, JPL in 1985 when I met him and he had this idea he wanted us to work out about putting a spaceship in orbit around the Sun, launch it from the Earth, put it in an orbit such that it would visit Mars uh, on a regular basis. And uh, when I first heard about this idea I thought it was very interesting but I knew that the Delta V was not going to be zero. That you would have to supply a Delta V every once in a while in order to enforce uh, this kind of trajectory. Um, <clears throat> the result is that uh, we ended up publishing a paper with my colleague Dennis Burns and um, myself and Buzz Aldrin. And uh, that is now called officially the Aldrin Cycler. And it's the idea of kind of having a space station that astronauts would catch up as it came by the Earth, get on board the space station and ride in this luxurious hotel in space, and uh, then get off when they approached Mars in another taxi vehicle. Meanwhile, the spaceship continues around and uh, goes on forever. So, of course, I asked my senior design class to, to design such a vehicle, and they came up with uh, this structure, and uh, this is uh, about uh, 70 meters uh, from end to end, so about two-thirds of a football field. Um, this is a nuclear reactor. It kind of looks like a Gemini spacecraft, but it's a nuclear reactor to provide power. And the astronauts would live uh, in these uh, HABs. And this thing, again, spins to produce artificial gravity on the way uh, to Mars and on the way back. This would be quite uh, uh, in or, uh, expensive uh, mission and something that would only be done when we have traveled with people to Mars uh, for quite a few years and we're ready to create a Mars space transportation system. And uh, so we've published a number of uh, papers uh, on these ideas, including uh, with Buzz Aldrin as a co-author. And uh, it's another uh, exciting thing uh, that I was lucky enough to participate in in my career. Now, what happens when you uh, combine <coughs> the idea of gravity assist and physics? Well, I've always been interested in knowing more about general relativity, and Professor Fishback taught a course. Uh, he's a professor of physics uh, on general relativity. I, was, I jumped at the chance to sit in on the class, and uh, what was even more wonderful and uh, I think uh, very lucky on my part was I was able to ask a question and solve a problem that hadn't been asked before, and that is 
If we do a gravity assist, which we have done as part of my career to use the concept of gravity assist, if we do a gravity assist with the planet, and we look at how much the uh, velocity vector is turned, the question is, we know what Newton says, and we use the Newtonian effect, but what is the general relativity effect of a uh, gravity assist? And I was able to find a new deflection equation that includes GR, general relativity. And it turns out that there's a little bit more of a deflection than Newton would say. If you put in the velocity of a typical spacecraft, most of the deflection is from Newton's law. Uh, but there's a small effect, which is actually a little bit more than the deflection of a light beam uh, that uh, the planet or sun would cause. And so uh, we ended up writing a paper uh, we had also the help of Professor Dan Shears, who at the time was uh, at the University of Michigan. He was a navigator at JPL, and we needed his understanding of how accurately we could measure things. And we ended up publishing a paper in Physical Review Letters in April 2001 called a new test of general relativity uh, using uh, spacecraft deflections. And uh, it would actually be able to test relativity to a more precise value than ever done in any prior missions. So I was very grateful to Professor Fishback uh, for teaching me the course and being excited and getting our paper published uh, in the most prestigious physics uh, journal in, in the world. I've been giving advice to, science, to um, students and uh, colleagues for a number of years and finally decided, why don't I write some of this stuff down? And I was uh, able to write a book called Advice to Rocket Scientists, a Career Survival Guide for Scientists and Engineers, where I talk about how to be successful and happy in a career where science and politics often clash. This is published by uh, AIAA, uh, the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. <coughs> And uh, in there, there's a number of things that I talk about, uh, why the workplace is different from school, uh, why you need two resumes, a, a short resume, but also a long resume, uh, what to bring to your interview, um, and uh, how important it is uh, to uh, uh, select a good boss to work for. So there are a number of uh, uh, bits of uh, advice in there. Uh, also, uh, how to survive your first two weeks on the job. So I've gotten a lot of very positive feedback on, on the book and uh, I hope that it'll help uh, those of you who are interested uh, in your careers. I also wrote a second book called uh, The Seven Secrets of How to Think Like a Rocket Scientist and this was written for fun but it uh, also has a serious aspect to it. Um, so I, I want to mention that uh, Again, my student, uh, Dr. Masa Okutsu, was the illustrator uh, for the book and a PhD student of mine. He's now a postdoc here at Purdue. And he drew this picture uh, showing uh, a rocket scientist. This is from Earth and his rocket. And here's another rocket scientist who knows where he's from and his technology. Uh, and they're on some alien planet. And they're both thinkers. And they both had to get there somehow. Now... <coughs> Let me use this clean slide here. The uh, <clears throat> seven secrets are as follows. Uh, the first one is called dream. And this is where you imagine you know, what things could be like. And I think that the most egregious dream of all was the one that uh, John Kennedy gave in 1961. And that was uh, the goal was to put a man on the moon and bring him back safely before the end of the decade. That was, that was really dreaming at that time. But the amazing thing is it came true. Uh, the next thing after dreaming is judging. And that is, if you look at a lot of ideas and don't reject anything and don't get critical and you have to come up with brainstorming, later on you're going to have to throw out kind of the crazy ideas and the ones that don't work. And then, you know, be a judge and uh, 
select the best ideas. This picture represents the concept of ask. Asking questions. In my book, there's no such thing as a dumb question. The dumb question is the one that didn't get asked, that should have been asked, and uh, then you're in trouble because we didn't ask the important question. Now we have um, check is the next idea. And that is, you know, if something can go wrong, it will. This is Murphy's Law, and we're always beating back errors, especially in the aerospace business where uh, a mistake can mean a disaster and it can mean a loss of life and loss of expensive spacecraft. So we're always fighting against uh, Murphy's Law. Then we have the so-called KISS principle. <clears throat> Keep it simple, stupid, or just plain simplify. So <clears throat> if you can write it in a more concise form, make it simple, then do it. That way there's fewer mistakes made. Then there's optimize. That is, how do you make it the best that it can be? One of the issues of optimizing is, say, minimize the propellant cost or minimize the, the mass of the rocket, because often that's associated with uh, dollars. So this is like minimize dollars. And then finally we have do. Because the most fun is when you actually get into mission operations, when you see the fruits of your effort uh, happen in a real mission. And so as the uh, Jedi Master <coughs> Yoda said, do or do not, there is no try. So with that thought, I wish you the best of luck uh, in your adventures in rocket science. <laughs>